welcome back to Our Walk in Christ. And today we are continuing in our discussion on the woes to the Pharisees. This is going to be lesson two and the first woe that we encounter, which is going to be in Matthew 23, 13. Before we get into that, you can help support the channel over on ourwalkinchrist.com forward slash support. There's a lot of free resources over there as well, but if you are inclined to help what we are doing here at Our Walk in Christ, you can pick up a book or a variety of other options as dictated on that page. Also, follow along on the social media accounts there. Stay tuned as to when we post new videos and get some links that you can easily share them out to your friends as well. Please do so. So let's go ahead and get on back. And today we have titled this woe, The Gospel According to the Pharisees. Very interesting indeed. Because the Pharisees are accused in this of certain things. Let's go ahead and get into the text first, which is going to be Matthew 23, verse 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering in. So, in other words, they're keeping people out of heaven. Think of that. You being the person standing in between someone's salvation. Now, we understand theologically that God is in control of our salvation, and therefore a Pharisee is not able to stand in the way of true faith. But the point he's making here is that the teachings that they are doing are, going to, are not going to lead people to a believing faith because they're teaching a false theology. And we find this in a lot of cults. They have a lot of deep religiosity, yet at the same time they do not preach something that is indicative of salvation. So the Pharisees are accused here of blocking the way to God. You see, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees were the highest religious leaders. They were the priests, the scribes, the lawyers, the people who had the access to God. So that remains to be seen. How did they block access? Did they just lock the door to heaven and lose the keys? Well, they might have. They have lost the keys through a series of extra rules. Now, to understand what we're talking about with all of these extra rules here. We have to see that the Israelites went into exile for disobedience from God. This is the whole Old Testament. He's calling various people. He calls Abraham out of Ur. He calls Moses to lead his people out of Israel. And then he calls various prophets to teach people in the way. But it hinges on the laws that God delivered through Moses and that the people did not follow those laws. And so after years and years and years of disobedience, he finally exiled the people and scattered them about the nations. And that's really what happened in the Old Testament times after the reign of King Solomon. The kingdoms split and then they devolved into probably just drunken debauchery and other things like that. And so what happened is God judged them and when he judged them, he separated them out. But when you get to the end of the Old Testament period chronologically, we have Ezra and we have Nehemiah, and they are going back and they are leading the charge of the people who are allowed to finally, after 70 years of captivity, are allowed to go back to Israel and rebuild their temple and rebuild their wall and rededicate themselves to God. And as they are doing this, they know and they understand that the reason they were cast out was because they failed to hold to the law. So Ezra, uh, in Ezra chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, we read, I say this, O oh my God, I am ashamed and embarrassed to lift up my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen above our heads and our guilt has even grown even to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt, and on account of our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, and to plunder, and to open shame, 
as it is this day. And he goes on here describing it's because of their sin. And he says in chapter 10, verse 1, Now while Ezra was praying and making confession, weeping and prostrating himself before the house of God, a very large assembly, men, women, and children, gathered to him in Israel, for the people wept bitterly. This is that time when you've woken up, when you've recognized that the sin has destroyed your life. You hit, as the psychologists say, rock bottom. You have collapsed under absolutely everything to look up and go, there is nowhere else to go but up. They wept bitterly. This period in their history marked the restoration to the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law was presented in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Numbers, in Deuteronomy. We have evidences of the law scattered out throughout these books. And what happened is the people now start to go back and turn back to God. The problem is is in an abundance of caution, the Pharisees started adding to a whole lot of rules. There were rules that they were knew were pretty clear, but then it got to the point where they're just kind of like, but, 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 I don't know, man. The, this one here's a little shaky. This one here might be sinful, but we just don't know. And so they start adding to their rules just to be on the safe side. This isn't a whole lot different from what happened in the Garden of Eden. So remember this in Genesis 3. And uh, we're going to look at um, verses 1 through 3 here. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field in which the Lord God had made him. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Now, we're going to stop right there in that verse. Did he really say you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Of course not. He said you may eat of every tree in the garden except the tree that is in the center of the garden, the tree of life you may not eat from it. So the woman answers, and said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Do you see how Eve added something to that? If you go back, he never said don't touch the tree. He just said don't eat it. Eve added to God's rulings because of temptation of the serpent. And the Pharisees did a very likewise thing. They started adding to the rules. The problem is when you start adding to the rules of God, we start seeing negative consequences. I didn't pull this verse out, but you can go ahead and look at it. It's like the very last couple verses of the Bible. Whoever adds anything to this law, let him be accursed. If you add from it, if you take away from it. Some churches these days take a lot away from the scriptures. They don't teach a sound gospel. Others add a lot to the scriptures. And today we're going to be looking at those people who have added a lot to the scriptures because this is what the Pharisees did. The gospel according to the Pharisees is to do a lot of good works and by your deeds you shall be saved. That is ultimately what they want to believe. So they started relying on their own rules instead of the law. They end up they they carried forth this oral tradition. Now there's a couple of different couple of different traditions. The Sanhedrin was one of them. There's a lot of very good accurate Jewish law in the Sanhedrin. Another one was the Mishnah, which was a series of rules which clarified all of the things they were and were not allowed to do. So this was, for example, they clarified what defined work. The Sabbath says you shall not do any work. God had provided some things you can do. In fact, the Pharisees' Mishnah overrode some of the things. He even says, you know, if an ox has fallen in a pit, you can lift it out. It's in the law. But according to the Pharisees, anything you do. I mean, you couldn't possibly lift that ox out of the well because it's the Sabbath day. They're worshiping the Sabbath. So eventually the Pharisees became more concerned with looking holy than they were concerned with 
being holy. Another woe that we will break into much later, but uh, it's going to be an illustrative point here, Matthew 23, 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they're full of dead man's bones and all uncleansiness. So they looked nice and pretty, but inside they were defiling. No one could go around the tombs without being uh, made unclean. And so this is what he was saying. You look really clean, but you're really unclean. We find something similar in Luke eleven thirty nine. 39. But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but inside you are full of robbery and wickedness. So here we have a case where the outside is looking shiny and clean. This is like if you're, you were a kid, right? And your mom's like, go clean your room. And you just take all the stuff off the floor and cram it under the bed or throw it into the closet. You're like, it's all clean. And then, you know, it looks really clean on the inside, but you open up that closet. And it's just this mess. And that is really what their heart looked like. Of course, Mark also added to this, Mark 7, verses 3 and 4. For the Pharisees all... And all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they came from their marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of the cups and pitchers and the copper pots. All right, so we see here the Pharisees are more concerned with looking holy. Of the many challenges to Jesus... We are ultimately given, the Pharisees ended up asking him, they asked Jesus, hey, can you answer me a question? What is the greatest commandment? Now, we're going to look at the account of this from um, Matthew 22 first. We're actually going to dive into all of these. But here's what we hear from Matthew 22, 34 to 40. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he, that's Jesus, said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands depends the whole law and the prophets. All right, now we're not going to read where these came from, but these came from Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18. So those two statements there, if you have an NASB like I have, you might see that more capitalized to stick out, or you might have as a quote in your translation. That's to indicate, or a footnote, that's to indicate it comes directly from those verses, Deuteronomy 6, 5, Le Leviticus 19, 18. Okay, so there we have the two commands. So the two commands boil down to loving God and loving people. They did not mean following a series of rules. So even in looking for the greatest of the rule, the greatest of the rule is to love people and to love God, primarily loving God. Now, by the way, loving people and loving God does not mean we are a milk toast, and it does not mean that we deny theology. Quite to the contrary, because true love for, may, for people and for God is to point people to the true interpretation of God, not one that is a list of rules. Seeking clarity, the Pharisee asks who his neighbor is. Now, we're also not going to read this. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan. You can go ahead and have a look in my parables series for a deep dive whole lesson specifically on the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is found in Luke 10, 30 to 37. The boiled down answer is our neighbor is whomever we meet in the time of need where we are right now. It had nothing to do with who lives proximally to you, despite a well-known book that is heretically moving its way through the churches that wants to deny that the greatest commandment is actually to love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. Now, what we find here, though, is that the scribe actually got it. 
The scribe got it. Now, Mark records the scribe's answer in a way that Luke and Matthew does not. But we have the exact same story, the exact same portion. Mark chapter 12, verses 32 to 34. The scribe said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one and there is no one else besides him. To love him with all your heart and all of your understanding and all with the strength and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered him intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. He got it. He understood the importance in what was going on. All right. It was more about the love, not about the sacrifices, not about the rules. Salvation is to love God, to trust him more than to trust your sin. In other words, salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you admit that you are a sinner and that you are incapable of doing anything about your sin? And that God, born of a virgin, came to the earth, walked upon the earth, taught us how to live, and then willingly died on the cross for our sins to be the perfect sin sacrifice for what we or no other person could have done. That he died on that cross, but he rose again on the third day, met with the disciples, and then ascended into heaven to prepare a place for us to come in. If you believe that, and you are ready to commit your life to that, and you're ready to love God and Jesus Christ more than you love your sins and turn away from your sins and towards Jesus Christ, that is what salvation means. And I invite you to do that now. Get a hold of me if you need any help with that. Getting back to the woe, the Pharisees were supposed to lead the way to God, but they blocked the way to God instead. John Calvin wrote about this, what purpose is served by religion and holy doctrine but to open up heaven to us? But the Pharisees closed that door and slammed it right in our faces. Now it's important to notice here that remember earlier on in uh, the last lesson, the introductory lesson on this, we said that Jesus said, hey, listen to the Pharisees, just don't do what they do. Hear what they say, do what they say, just don't do what they do. This is because indeed, and contrary to some theologies uh, running around in the modern church, we are indeed commanded to have righteousness. In fact, he says in the Sermon of the Mount on Matthew 5, 20, for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter in the kingdom of heaven. So we have to be more righteous than these guys. We have to be more righteous than the most righteous people walking the planet right now. How can we possibly be more righteous than these people who are so righteous they've added to the rules? Well, of course, the first tip is to not add to the rules. The rules, as they are written, is exactly what it is. We talk about rules like, oh, there's no rules. We're under grace. Well, we had a daily walk about that. I'll invite you to look at that. But we find this righteousness in Christ. Because again, if you're following Christ, if you're trusting Christ, if you've placed your trust in Jesus Christ, admitted that you are a sinner, accepted that sacrifice, and turned away from your sin, this is where we find this righteousness, which only comes in trusting Jesus Christ. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but what is due. But the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness, not on the basis of our works, but on the basis of our faith. All right. Now, we have some words to say to the modern church, because the modern church itself oftentimes does not necessarily follow the words of scripture. And that is kind of a problem. But this here is not going to be battling the modern church as far as like the church growth group. This actually follows more of the cults, maybe Catholicism, which requires several sacraments to be saved. 
baptismal regeneration would be one thing. And there's some Protestant churches that will believe that as well. This is mostly pertains to the groups who add a lot of requirements to salvation. Catholicism adds several points. You, you have to take communion with mass. You have to be baptized. You have to go through some confirmation. There's several things you need to do or you will be excluded from the kingdom in Catholicism. The other place you find this a lot is in the cults, which place exorbitant amounts of restrictions upon people. Some cults a lot more, some cults a lot less. The problem with these groups is they try to earn righteousness by works. But God is not pleased with our works. Remember Isaiah 64, verse 6, For all of us who have become like the one who is unclean, all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind takes us away. Let's keep that in mind. We can try to jump, jump the Grand Canyon. Some of us are going to get further. Some of us are going to get a little bit less far. All of us are going to end up splattered on the bottom of the canyon because we cannot reach that chasm. We cannot jump this. Only Jesus has made the way, and I implore you today to place your trust in him, not in the Pharisees and not into the rules and not into the regulations, but that part of salvation is to turn from your sin and sin no more. The applications that we draw, number one is be aware of giving uh, any uh, of anyone who gives you a condition of salvation. So if anyone comes up and says, you need to do this to be saved, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. Other than, of course, accepting the gospel. That's the only thing. But if they're like, well, you need to submit a W-2 and give 10% of your money to the church, eh, eh. Eh, wrong answer. You need to be baptized by our church. Your baptism wasn't real. Eh, wrong answer. Of course, as long as we're talking about a believer's baptism. But even if the church you went to doesn't necessarily follow God anymore, if, if you were baptized in that church and it was a public profession and you did it because you were called to be baptized by Christ, even if that church walks away and strays away or you leave that church, that baptism is still real. You do not have to be rebaptized at your new church. Now, if you were sprinkled as an infant and had no say in the matter, yes, I implore you to get baptized. Uh, but it's still, it's not a requirement of salvation. It is something that demonstrates our salvation. So in other words, second application, good works flow from our relationship with Christ. They do not lead to our relationship with Christ. We can't do good works to have a relationship with Christ. We do good works because of our relationship with Christ. And the third is to have faith in Christ alone. No rules, no extra limits. Stop keeping people from entering the kingdom of heaven. I'm speaking to you, Pharisees and cults and people who add to the faith. Father God, we thank you for this message. We thank you for the ability to come to your word and to open it up and to unfold so much out of one little verse and to examine the gospel according to the Pharisees. And I pray, Lord, that you will keep that gospel away from us and give us the true gospel of true faith and salvation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So thanks for coming along on this edition of the Woes to the Pharisees. We'll be back next week. Once again, follow along on the social media there. Share these videos far and wide, whether that be on the YouTube channel or on the BitChute channel, particularly on YouTube. This is the content YouTube does not like to promote to people. So go ahead and uh, pass this on out so others may hear the truth as well. Also have a look at the website, ourwalkinchrist.com. Thanks for coming along and hope that you enjoy your daily walk in our Lord.